He never ever saw the uh, inner, inner coffin, the, the mummy, uh, the, certainly not the gold mask. But it's the iconic object of the tomb. He never, he never saw that. Interestingly, the first time um, my great aunt Evelyn saw that was when it came to British Museum exhibition in 1972. He, he said he wanted the Times to disseminate the information immediately and free to the Egyptian press and then to the Newby Weekly News, his local paper here. And then the Times were going to charge all the other newspapers, the Daily Mail, Telegraph. There were many more different papers such as aren't around today, including the American ones. All the other press then went crazy because they were going to have to pay the Times and it's going to be a day late. And in journalism, you know, speed is of the essence even then. And they were really pissed off. It gave Carnarvon £5,000, which was quite a lot of money then, because he was paying for all the excavation costs. He had Christmas here. He and his wife asked all Howard Carter's family to lunch. When he was in England, he went and saw King George V and Queen Mary and told them all about it. And then he went back to Egypt in January to finish excavating the first room before having the grand opening with the Queen of the Belgians, because she was very keen on Egyptology in February. Carnarvon was very slim, very fragile. He'd had bad health problems. Carter walked with a stick because he kind of dressed like Carnarvon. He kind of aped many of his clothes. He respected him so much. He, he wasn't in the strongest health and all the stress, you know, he couldn't walk down the street without being tackled by somebody. But on the boat, I think he, everybody wanted to know and Everybody wanted, everyone was writing in saying, can I please have something from Tutankhamun's tomb, it'll bring me luck. I mean, the letters in the Griffiths Institute from the fan clubs, which was overwhelmed. So you've got Luxor being overwhelmed, you've got journalists camping in the Winter Palace Hotel, all the rooms being sold out. Everybody claimed to know Lord Carnarvon, everyone, you know, was related to him, everybody wanted to be there. Big thing, and this man was five foot ten and under nine stone. And they knew what was in the first room and um, had apparently, find out later, gone through in and seen the shrine walls. And they were both exhausted. Mm. They were completely exhausted. But the hassle of all the press deals and dealing with everything, he just went down to on, the, on his boat to uh, Aswan uh, direction. And then the process got bitten by a mosquito on his face, which he didn't look after very well. And the wound went um, septic. The famous story is that he cut it with a, one of those um, steel cutthroat razors and didn't put iodine on it, and it went nasty. And he got septicemia. So he struggled through March, sometimes better, sometimes worse, with, with really what was blood poisoning. But it didn't actually, amazingly, didn't, didn't, didn't kill him. But finally he got weak. It sort of half recovered from that. And then, of course, it was got by pneumonia when something else uh, came. But there, there weren't antibiotics. And, and, and so he, he very sadly um, um, succumbed. But Howard Carter spent the last month of Carnarvon's life with him. You know, there's rumours that they had a huge argument, split up and never spoke, which is not so... The minute Carnarvon was really ill in, Egypt, in Cairo, Howard Carter left the Valley of the Kings and rushed up there. He died in, in, in April 1923. His family therefore lost control of the, of the project. Howard Carter did a wonderful job working for my great-grandmother up to 1930, carefully taking everything out of the tomb bit by bit, and of course it's all in the Cairo. A museum. At the time, England, Egypt was acknowledged as an English protectorate, but England sort of shared it with France. England's main aim in Egypt was not to conquer Egypt. They just wanted a stable country because that was part of their route to India. There was a lot of, of, of difficult politics after he died in, in terms of uh, how the tomb was going to be excavated. There's a question whether it was an intact tomb. Most objects are meant to stay in Egypt. If it wasn't an intact tomb, they could come back to, um, uh, or some could come back uh, to, to the excavator. Uh, but um, I think really in the case of Tutankhamun, it might have been only some duplicate objects that, that he would have been able to have, but they would have been better than... Um, um, and um, nothing at all. I mean, it has to be said that great grandfather was a, a soothing diplomatic influence at the highest level between Britain and local Egyptian people. And, and again, it was a, a big loss of, of an anchor of support to Howard Carter once he um, he died. And he spent all his money. By the time he died, Bretby had gone, Somerset Estates had gone, most of the houses in London had gone, and quite a lot of the land around here had gone. So he spent of his fortune out there. Finally, later on in the 30s, my um, grandfather was rewarded with a 
compensation for the work done after the fine. Um, never all the many years leading up to it outside the valley or all the rest of it. But, but, um, um, so that there was something back from the Egyptian government. In some ways, the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb was a curse, certainly for both men. And, you know, it was desperately upsetting for Lord Carnarvon's wife and daughter and son in the estate who'd lost a wonderful man who was only 56 years old. Nothing.